Hello, everyone. Good, af good afternoon. Uh, I am delighted to welcome everyone to the Sager Series, one of our premier events, and we have premier attractions. We get the very best people to come speak at the Sager Series. Part of the reason we get the very best people is because this series is named for Tom Sager. Tom Sager uh, worked his way up the general counsel in the legal department up to general counsel of DuPont. Along the way, he noticed two things, uh, that um, legal departments were too white. And he also noticed that they weren't as efficient as they could be, especially in using ADR. So on the first issue, uh, he's dedicated his professional life to diversity in the legal profession. The Minority Counsel Association has named a Tom Sager Award in his honor. Uh, the Lawyers of Color Association have given him their Legacy Award, Burton Foundation, a prestigious award presented at uh, the Library of Congress, and uh, 2018, Wake Forest University bestowed an honorary Doctors of Law on Tom Sager for all this work. Uh, on, the, on his ADR in the uh, legal counsel's office, um, the, the model came to be known formally as the DuPont legal model, but informally as the Tom Sager model. Um, and Tom, I want you to know before I embarrass you and make you stand up, I, uh, <laughs> I, sp I already have, but more, there's more embarrassment. Uh, uh, I asked the three L's to have lunch with me uh, in small groups, and I always ask the group what stands out in these past three years, and a student said, uh, the Sager series. I've, I'm, a I'm not gonna make eye contact with her because she's here again today. Um, but the Sager series, I haven't missed a one, and they're always fantastic. <laughs> I won't look at you, go see Tom Sager. Tom, would you stand and let us give you a round of applause? This law school has given me amazing opportunities, but Mr. Archer, I'll have to say that this one, meeting you, uh, ranks right up there with getting to hang out with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So I'm, I'm thrilled, thrilled to meet you. And I won't spend long on Dennis Archer's life and accomplishments because our own Professor Amari Simmons is gonna take us through that. But let me just say, uh, son of Detroit, grew up there, uh, went to law school there, uh, he, he, got, he practiced law, got tapped for the Supreme Court of Michigan, later got elected to the Supreme Court of Michigan. Uh, but his, the city that he loved was reputed to be dying. And so he served two terms as mayor of Detroit and really ushered in the Detroit Renaissance. Uh, practiced law with Dickinson Wright, where he became the chairman. Um, appointed to the ABA presidency, became the first African American to be president of the ABA. Uh, millions of awards, um, but the one I suspect, I don't know if it means the most, but has to mean a lot to him. Uh, I read that he grew up uh, admiring Thurgood Marshall, and, and who was, of us didn't, and in uh, 2016, the ABA gave it the ABA medal to Mr. Archer. It's not presented often, but among the select group who have received that are Thurgood Marshall and Dennis Archer. Uh, leading us in conversation with Mr. Archer will be our own Professor Amari Simmons, Howard L. Olick, Professor of Law and Director of our Business Law Program. Uh, Professor Simmons is a Wake undergrad, a Penn Law grad. He clerked for uh, the Honorable Norm Vesey, Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. He was in the Corporate Counsel Office of two multinational corporations and an associate at Wilmer Hale. Uh, he has his own Simmons Foundation, uh, a pipeline foundation to help spread access to college, and his most recent book is a potential on the periphery about the experience of those students. So I'm, I'm proud of everyone involved with this program, Tom Sager, Dennis Archer, and Professor Simmons, who will lead us in a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. 
I want to make sure you can hear me. Is, is everything okay? Um, I wanted to just uh, first say it's, it's an honor to be here um, to um, interview um, Dennis uh, for our Sager series, but also I want to recognize Tom as well. Um, the, a lot of these special relationships, are, is, and I think that speaks to what this actual series is about, and it's great to have alums like Tom who continue to come back and support the school. Um, but to our speaker, what I'd like to do today is we're going to have a conversation, a relaxed conversation for about, let's say now, maybe 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So if you have a question, hold on to it. You'll, you'll have your opportunity. Um, but I, I first want to say it's not normal for us to have someone uh, comes to speak to us who's at, not only at the Heidi League profession, but you've touched so many areas and been impactful with your leadership, whether it's been the law, whether it's been business, and also politics. And so I won't take a lot of time because the introduction was very elegant and wonderful, but what I will do is let's just start with your background um, and what you're comfortable in sharing. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background? I was born in the city of Detroit, okay. and um, at the age of five, moved to Cassopolis, Michigan. Cassopolis, Michigan is about 187 miles from the city of Detroit. It's in the southwest corner of the state. It's about 24 miles from South Bend, Indiana. Maybe about 37 from Three Rivers, 50 from Kalamazoo, just to put it in perspective. And um, when I moved there, uh, we, my uncle drove us to, uh, to Cassopolis where I was going to meet my father for the first time. My dad and mom were married in uh, Cassopolis, Michigan. And when she became pregnant with me, it dawned on him, of course, that he had no car. No car that would allow him to go to either Niles or South Bend or someplace where there's hospital. So he said, I think it would be wise if you would go and spend time in Detroit because her mother and her three brothers and uh, sister lived there. And so I was born there, lived there for five years. We drove in a car to Cassopolis, Michigan. And I get out and I see my dad and my dad is everything that has been described to me. And it was like I've, I've known him all my life, the same. And so after a big hug and whatnot, I turned to mom and said, Mom, I got to go to the bathroom. She said, come along. She grabbed me by the hand. And we walked to an outhouse. I didn't know what it was. But she said, that's where you go. And we have what is called a honey pot that's in the house that will be used at night. It's your responsibility during the day when you get up to go empty it, etc." So for um, the next uh, 12 years, uh, I took a bath every Saturday night in the metal tub, and um, we had no running water. Um, my dad had a third grade education. Uh, he lost his arm just above his left elbow in a car accident before I was born. My mother had a high school diploma. And I left a city that was 1.82 million people and moved to Cassopolis Village and the village had 1,200 people. And it was an interesting awakening. Okay. Uh, my dad uh, worked for a gentleman who owned a tool and die shop um, in, the, in South Bend, Indiana. His winter home was in Sarasota, Florida, and he had a summer home on Diamond Lake in Cassopolis. Diamond Lake, uh, was an area uh, in Cassopolis that did not allow any person of color to own any land and no one of color could swim in that lake. That's what I grew up with. But the best thing I had was two outstanding parents who loved me to death, who made it very clear to me that if I wanted to be something or make something out of my life. It was absolutely important that I get a good education, and therefore I was going to go to college, which meant teachers were always right, always right. <laughs> and um, they made it clear that it was important for me to go to college. My uncles and my aunt, same thing. 
and that was the motivating factor. We were so poor we couldn't pay attention sometimes, but uh, <laughs> it was the kind of thing that I grew up with. But I grew up with great values, respect for people, and that was what gave me the foundation upon which I built my life. And in keeping with that, uh, what attracted you to the law? Why did you go to law school? I started teaching. Um, well, let me just run through it right quick. Graduated from Cassopolis High School, the largest graduating class ever, 79, because it was <laughs> because of the size of the Class C school. And the only thing we did in chemistry, for example, is that we made oxygen. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I graduate from high school. I start working uh, while I'm in uh, Cassopolis. I started my first job was a caddy on the golf course. I was eight years old, and um, then I worked in a bakery, then I worked with one of my classmates' fathers, who was a uh, interior design, he would design things with metal, and I worked for him. And when I graduated from high school, I went right into a furniture factory there to earn some money to go to Wayne State. I'd been accepted to Wayne State University in Detroit. And so uh, I started working in the factory, and then, they offered, after two weeks, health insurance. I've never had health insurance before. I'd lied about my age so I could get the job, and then I filled out the form so I could get health insurance. I said, well, maybe I better tell the truth. Well, they found I was too young, got fired, went, went to um, uh, Detroit, started working for a real estate company, uh, painting with oil-based paints, for those of you who've ever had that privilege. And during the summer, boy, the oil paint base, if you would, start painting the closet, if it's hot out, I mean, you it, inhale all of that stuff. And then when you are up painting eaves troughs, the paint's running down your, in any event, my uncle got me a job working at a um, pharmacy. It was right down the block for, where his real estate company was. So I went to Wayne and met the, farm, met the counselor, and the counselor said, um, what do you want to be? I said, I'd like to be a pharmacist. Nobody could tell me in the family what I should be or what I should consider majoring in. It didn't take long for me in pharmacy not to get along, about a year and a half. And then ultimately I transferred up to Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. And um, a counselor asked me what I wanted to be. My friends, many of them were teachers, they taught high school history, loved history. I said, I want to be a high school history teacher. He said, let me give you a piece of advice. If you become a high school history teacher, you will, or if that's what you want to do, you'll be lucky if you get able to teach junior high school history because it's, we just got too many history teachers. So I went back to the dorm, the only dorm on campus that did not serve food. It was called Hungry Hall. Affectionately, we called it <laughs> Vandercook Hall. I mean, it was Vandercook Hall, but we called it Hungry Hall. I still have a, t a sweatshirt Sleeves are all off, it's full of holes, but I proudly wear it um, because it reminds me of what we went through. I went back to the dorm. My roommate, who I'd never met, had a letter, stack of letters this tall, and I asked around because he had not come back to school yet. And I was told that he was uh, a teacher, so I asked him when I met him, what, what do you teach? He said, special education. And so he explained to me what was involved. I thought it would be a good challenge, a good opportunity to do something. So I went back to see the counselor, and then I graduated from Western as a um, teacher for special education. Today we call them learning disabled students. The principal thought that I was so good with my students because I would go back home after class take off my suit or sport jacket and tie. And I'd come back in jeans or khakis or something and I'd get involved in a pickup game with the kids on the playground or I'd go by my kids' homes and talk to their parents and ask them or share with them what I thought they could do to be of help, to help motivate their kids and to work with them. And so the principal said, you get along well with the teachers, so why don't you go and become a principal if you better know how to do that, you need a master's degree. I said, okay, so I enrolled in a master's course at University of Michigan at a um, 
location that they had um, that they were teaching in Detroit and I wound up using the same two textbooks that I used at Western Michigan so I was dating this teacher and I said oh why am I I mean why I mean I'm not learning anything new and the more I talked about it she said why don't you go to law school I don't know anything about lawyers. I've never met them, never been in a lawyer's office, etc. The more I whined or complained, the more she said, go to law school. So I took the LSAT exam, got a score that suggested, because nobody promises you anything. Nobody promises you if you go to law school that you're going to graduate. Nobody promises you're going to get good grades. Nobody promises you're going to be able to accomplish what you want to do and how you do it, how, you know, what kind of law and, and it's, will you be successful, etc. But I started law school. I taught school during the day, and I went to law school at night. And along the way, about midway through, I did the wisest thing I have ever done, and that is I proposed to the teacher, and she said, yes, we've been married 51 years. <laughs> So that I fell in love with the law. I mean, when I was growing up in Cassopolis, I didn't see a television uh, until I was in about the ninth or tenth grade. And then when I'd watch the news, I would see what was going on in Montgomery, Alabama. I learned about Rosa Parks and a minister called Reverend Doctor or Reverend Martin Luther King. And then a couple years later. I found out about this lawyer called Thurgood Marshall, who, because he and a fully integrated team working for the defense firm, defense, legal defense fund for the NAACP, took on cases, one of which was Brown versus the Board of Education, which opened up, in theory, opened up a lot of opportunities. And I fell in love with the law. And I also, while I was in law school, I went to work for a lawyer, um, African-American lawyer, his firm. And it was during the time in 1967, that summer, that the city of Detroit had a big riot or rebellion, whatever people would, would care to call it. And in Detroit, we've got an island called Bill Isle, recreational area, nice, pristine. They had 7,218 people who had been arrested and on that island. And the judges made a call to all lawyers, no matter what your specialty happens to be, we need you to come in and walk these people into the court so they can understand what they're charged with so that whether or not they might deserve bail, no bail, whatever the case may be, but they deserve to know what they're charged with. And I watched all of that take place. So between the law books and what I saw, I could not wait to become a lawyer in an effort to try to make a difference in the lives of people who needed help. In law school, when I was at the Detroit College of Law, we did not have one clinical class, not one clinical class. They had started moot court, but that was it, but not the clinical classes. The things that have evolved and changed in legal education is just enormous and outstanding. Yeah. But I fell in love with the law and I've always respected what lawyers and judges and law professors and people involved in the law can do to help people. No, and interesting enough, you mentioned judges. And so I wanted to uh, talk about what your book, and for everyone in the audience, Let the Future Begin. It's a, it's a wonderful book. And in the book, you mentioned the highlight of your legal career uh, as a lawyer, uh, that is, was being a justice on the Michigan Supreme Court. And can you talk a little bit about that experience? I had been very happy practicing law 
I've been very happy helping other people become elected to serve as judges, serve on the Michigan Supreme Court, serve as United States Congressman, serve as governor of the state of Michigan. And so I enjoyed helping others be elected, but I never thought anything about being on the court. Uh, along the way, uh, Judge George W. Crockett, um, who was a judge uh, involved in a new Bethel case in the city of Detroit back in the day, he called me over to his chambers and said, why don't you uh, think about running for judge? I went to my mentor, Judge Damon Keith, and Judge Keith said, keep practicing law, make some money, take care of your family. At some point, you never know, you might just get a telephone call and you just be ready. A lot of us are making sacrifices and trying to do things to open up doors. What you may not have an appreciation for is that when I graduated from law school, I had clerked one summer for Damon Keith's law firm. I clerked one, server, one summer in the office of general counsel of Ford Motor Company. Two stark contrasts. So when I was getting ready to graduate from law school, I sent out letters of interest in law firms, and I was invited to come to this big law firm downtown to interview. And I went in, and I sat down, and we talked. He thanked me for coming, and then promptly told me that the law firm does not hire graduates from the Detroit College of Law. I said, okay, thank you very much. And um, I left. And I did what I think most law students would do. I went to, before the interview, I went to Martin Dale Hummel to see who was going to be interviewing me. I walked out not knowing how happy I was that I did not know or experience the work of a person that I had later in life grown to enjoy, Richard Pryor. Because if I had enjoyed Richard Pryor at the time that I finished that interview, I probably would not have been or carried myself the way that I did <laughs> because this person graduated from the Detroit College of Law oh. and telling me, in the reality, there was not a large law firm in the state of Michigan that had an associate of color or a partner of color and had very few staff, if any, of color. There's a lot that has changed, and a lot of it's changed, as was noted by the dean in her recognition of Tom Sager, because of the work that he and Stacy Mobley and so many others decided to do and to join in in an effort to make some changes. And then speaking of which, um, I want to talk about changes uh, throughout the legal profession. Um, and you served as president of the American Bar Association, which, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the largest voluntary professional organizations in the world, um, hundreds of thousands of members. And serving as president, could you just uh, briefly talk about what were some of your priorities as president of that organization? It was the same priority that uh, I had carried, by and large, most of my professional legal career, whether I was president of the Wolverine Bar the National Bar Association, the first person of color as president of the State Bar of Michigan, or indeed the American Bar, and that is, I believe in diversity and inclusion. I believe in equal opportunity for women. When I was going to law school, I think there were four women in our class. As I've watched over the years how women have just, are just so bright, so brilliant. And, I, and let me just leave this 
So it's, I'm always consistent. Every time I've gone to a law school and talked to a class, or if I've talked at a graduation where I've been fortunate enough to receive a few doctorates of law in my life, I've made the same observation, the same observation I do when I'm in high school or junior high school talking to classes. Guys, if you ever in life underestimate the brilliance, the intellect, and the power of a woman, you will lose every time, and I can almost <laughs> guarantee it. So you be very respectful, because the people that you're sitting next to right now could very well be a general counsel, a CEO, or in a C-suite, or some place that's going to make a difference as to whether or not you might get hired. And if you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, and are not respectful, it will come back and it will haunt you. So always be respectful. And if you work hard, you might even beat them. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I um, and was saying just uh, briefly, I wanted to also acknowledge that in your immediate family, uh, you were not the only judge. Or That's lawyer. true. My wife, who encouraged me to go to law school, uh, after our second son was born, uh, went to law school, and she became assistant corporation counsel for the city of Detroit, the legal department, uh, under Mayor Coleman Young. And then she was an assistant dean at the Detroit College of Law. And I did not know at the time she was encouraging me to go to law school that her grandfather was a lawyer and went to uh, the Detroit College of Law. And um, Governor Blanchard, who appointed me to the Michigan Supreme Court, appointed her to the 36th District Court, a state district court in the city of Detroit, where she served for 17 and a half years before she retired. No, and, uh, and sticking a little bit with the American Bar Association, for the students in the room, um, could you talk a little bit about ways in which newly minted attorneys who are starting out their careers, how they become engaged in a meaningful way with the American Bar Association, and why they want to do that? Today is a lot different than when I started practicing law. When I started practicing law and I got active in the American Bar Association Young Lawyers, uh, then section, now it's called a division, I went to my first ABA meeting in 1972. There were about 1,500 of us from all over the United States. I just left Miami attending my second annual meeting of the National Bar Association. National Bar Association overwhelmingly, predominantly African American. And I go to San Francisco uh, for our annual meeting. And I go to this meeting and I'd been invited by the chair of the Young Lawyers section. And I'd been invited through John Kersel who was my friend in Michigan who had been active in the ABA because uh, Harry Hathaway from uh, Los Angeles, California wanted to make the same kind of statement that Chesterfield Smith, who was the incoming president of the American Bar Association, came to the National Bar Association annual meeting, met with the executive committee, and said, we in the American Bar Association have made a mistake. We have precluded lawyers of color from being members. At one point in 1908, there were three colored or Negro lawyers who joined the American Bar, and they were promptly put out when they found out they were lawyers of color. And then they changed the application, and you had to list your ethnicity on the application to make sure that they didn't let anybody of color into the American bar. And if they didn't know who you were, lawyers from your community would come to your law office to look at you in the face to make sure that you're not a person of color. That didn't change until 1948. Uh, Mr. Justice Felix Frankfurter um, required and asked um, William Coleman to become a member of the ABA, which he did. And that broke the barrier and broke the ice. But when I was going 
from what I saw in 1972, I met so many outstanding, wonderful lawyers from all over the United States. And it taught me how to engage in client maintenance, in business development, because as big as your law firm might be or talent, you're going to have conflicts. And when you have conflicts, you want to go to somebody you know and trust. And so you go to people that you've met within the association. And so there are also continuing legal education classes that was always going on. And young lawyers always were the ones who delivered on on pro bono work or help to others in need. There's Ralph Charles Dusick, I believe, from West Virginia, a young lawyer. They had a disaster in his home state, and he got his young lawyers to come together to reach out uh, to help people who were in need, and that went nationwide. I mean, those of you who have engaged in clinical classes if you've ever helped anybody who needed something, whether you won for them or you didn't, there's nothing like a feeling when somebody looks you in an eye and genuinely tells you, thank you so much. It makes a difference. And that's what all of us experienced. And it was something that we took back home. Not everybody could come to the ABA meetings, but Law firms at that time used to send all of that. It was almost mandatory because of how much you could learn. Then, of course, we hit a couple of recessions, and all of a sudden, folks started saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. We're not going to send them, um, et cetera. So I would encourage you to stay, get involved, stay involved. You will learn a lot, and you will never know where it will take you because you don't know who that person is might become or do that be, that can give you a break or give you an opportunity in life. No, and in speaking about making that impact, uh, moving a little bit away from, from the law, I want to talk about your time as mayor of Detroit. And uh, the title of your book, Let the Future Begin, is also happens to be your campaign slogan. Um, it's, it's interesting that after leaving the bench, uh, instead of going to a law firm necessarily, you, you pursued becoming a, a mayoral candidate. And so can you talk about why did you do that? And also, what does the phrase, let the future begin, mean to you? And how did that come about? The city of Detroit that I love and loved was coming on some and experiencing a lot of hard times. Mayor Young, our first mayor of color, had been in office for over 16 years, and he was into his, working through his 20th year. And the business community that had initially been very supportive and helpful left the city of Detroit. And we lost a lot of population. If you recall, I, was, you, I mentioned that Detroit, when I was growing up, I was born, had a population of about 1.82 million people by, as we're approaching um, and the 1990 census, had the population at just over 1 million people. We'd lost over 800,000 folks. So we lost, as a city, there's principally two ways you have money coming in income tax and property tax. Well, when you lose people and they're no longer living in the city, so you lose property tax, and if you, if you lost 800,000 people, you don't have the same number of people living in the homes that they used to, and so when people couldn't sell out their, or couldn't sell their homes, couldn't rent it out any further, we started having a phenomena around um, Halloween called Devil's Night. We had people coming in from other countries, from Japan and Germany and from Europe, 
taking photograph or taking with their video cameras, television cameras, fires that were going on around the city. And they could not understand how could a city, how could people burn their own city? It was people who wanted to get what they could out of their property. And so they were hiring people to torch their homes, etc. And we had people without jobs. We had kids who were injuring or killing each other over designer glasses or gym shoes or whatever the case may be. And it was not pretty. I'd been encouraged to consider running for mayor. I, I never took them serious. But the more I saw, the more I felt. And there are some of us, we're aging out, but there are some of us who believe that the practice of law is a calling. It's not just to make money, it's not just to what, but it's a calling. And I thought that perhaps if I would be, if I could find solutions to the problems that we faced in the city of Detroit, that I thought I might be able to make a difference. And so I went to the governor who appointed me and said, there was a 20 year absence from the time that Otis Smith, who was the absolute first person of color to be on our Michigan Supreme Court, he lost an election. He ultimately went on to become uh, Vice President General Counsel of General Motors, the largest corporation in America at the time. And um, it had been 20 years since we had a person of color. At the time, I was president of the State Bar of Michigan coming out of the office. The governor appointed me to serve on the Supreme Court. I, Judge Keith called and said, you're going to be getting a telephone call. Turns out I was in, in Paris at the time. I'd gone over to uh, London first for the second half of our American Bar annual meeting. Then we are in Paris, my law partner at the time, uh, he and his wife, or his wife had a cosmetic business over there. I get a call from Judge Keith who says, you're going to be getting a call from the governor. You need to say yes when that comes. A lot of us have sacrificed. I told you the time would come. So the time has come. You need to consider it. At the time, both of our sons, um, and we'd taken them over to London and Paris with us. They were in private school. Their tuition was more than it cost somebody to go to in state, go to University of Michigan, and um, for tuition, board, etc. And at the time, I was in a very outstanding plaintiff's law firm. And I was scheduled because of the product liability case and a number of other things that if I'd have remained, I'd have topped out over $250,000 a year. And for somebody who grew up like I did, that was important. But the 1990 census had the city of Detroit leading the nation of having the highest percentage of people living below poverty, 32.2%. And when you factored in the kids who lived in those homes, 46.6% of our children in Detroit live below poverty. Detroit then acknowledged or believed to be motor city capital of the United States, if not America, if not the world, 35% of our age-eligible adults could not afford to own a car. So I resigned from the Michigan Supreme Court. I went up to the University of Michigan to meet with President Jim Duterstadt, said I need about five or six professors that would be willing to work with me to see if we couldn't find solutions to the problems we were facing. I mean, anybody could point out the problems. What we needed was solutions. What we need is to give people hope, cause them to believe in themselves and into the city. And when I found the solutions, we started looking for somebody to help me be 
run the campaign. And so we settled in on a political consultant. His name, David Axelrod. David Axelrod had run a number of mayoral campaigns, and he was the one who suggested Let the Future Begin to be the campaign theme. And it was not about the future begin with me. It was about what, does, what do the citizens of the city of Detroit want for their city? What is, it that, what is it that was important to them? Were they ready to work for a brighter future? And by the time we had finished a, a document, I'd, working with the professors, we, I came up with a document with the help of others that helped write it called Thoughts for a Greater Detroit. It's about 56 pages. And it, it described what people would see in, on January 1st, 2001, if I would become mayor. And um, I took that document into homes, church basements, then into sanctuaries, and then into um, community colleges to talk about this document and said, this is my suggestion, but it's a living document. What will make it better? What would, what would cause you to believe in it? We wound up with 6,400 campaign workers on election day, and I was fortunate enough to win. That, it, let the Future Begin was about the city of Detroit and what it wanted to be. And it made a difference. We needed jobs. We got an empowerment zone. Nobody gave Detroit a prayer. In fact, when, because Mayor Young was not running, um, the county executive for Wayne County, which has Detroit, Hamtramck, and by the way, Hamtramck and um, Highland Park are two cities, as folks from Michigan who live in Michigan, who are students here, will know, um, is surrounded by the city of Detroit. So he was going to include three cities. And I said, no bet to me, to myself. And so turned out that the person who we had working on getting an empowerment zone application in was the partner of one of my, one of my partners when I was practicing law. I went to his wife and said, come work for me. She worked for me. We put together an empowerment zone that nobody could match. We had the absolute best empowerment zone uh, application. The commitment was for $1.92 billion to be invested, because that was the requirement. Whatever was committed, it was irrevocable, whether you won it or not, the empowerment zone. And it turned the city around. And it has made a difference. Along the way, having watched what Stacy Mobley and Tom Sager and others like them, what they did, I was looking for a way to try to bring in businesses of color. Well, the businesses that left the city of Detroit left the city of Detroit with businesses of color, black, Hispanic, women. A judge during the summer that we were running for mayor found that the Mayor Young's set-aside program, affirmative action program, did not meet Richmond versus Croson. So it was killed. An outstanding African-American woman who I convinced, along with others, to come to the city of Detroit to leave a partnership at Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro in San Francisco, became my corporation counsel. And during our first year, because you, there was no way we could show disparate impact we had a black mayor, and now you got another one. Then you've got majority of people who are directors or deputy directors of the department were black. Majority of the city council was black. 
we couldn't show, we couldn't satisfy Richmond versus Croson. She came up with Executive Order 4, which required all city um, departments to do at least 30% of their spend with Detroit-based businesses. Ultimately, we won the empowerment zone. We were able to attract new businesses. Governor uh, John Engler, uh, who was the governor at the time, came up with the Renaissance Zones. And we were able to, to cause thousands of new people to go to work, businesses uh, to flourish. And we also, along the way, uh, convinced the state of Michigan uh, to give the city of Detroit the opportunity to have three casinos. Um, we built a brand new um, football stadium. The Detroit Lions came back. The uh, Detroit Tigers built one. And now, uh, just in the last couple of years, um, the Illich family, who owns the Detroit Tigers and Detroit Red Wings, built a new arena, uh, Little Caesars Arena, for the Red Wings to play. And then the Pistons came back to Detroit. So you can't go. Detroit wound up in the bankruptcy after I left. Regrettably, the person who followed me did not have the citizens of the city of Detroit as his first mission he was ultimately found guilty of about 24 felony counts and was sentenced to uh, 28 years in prison. The person who succeeded him inherited his $315 million deficit, which the city, because of what occurred during almost eight years that he was in office, we lost a lot of jobs, businesses, et cetera, again. And um, Detroit went into bankruptcy. As Soon as they came out of bankruptcy, you could not rent, lease, or buy a loft, apartment, condominium, any housing in downtown Detroit or midtown Detroit. If you drove a car, you moved into the city, and you wanted to rent a space at a covered garage, you couldn't rent a covered garage space anywhere in the city. You come into the city of Detroit today, you see all kinds of new businesses, etc. Dan Gilbert, um, who you may see some ads for Quicken Loans, his investment and others who've invested in the city, I mean, it's just enormous. And you got young people who've come into the city, and it's a great place to do business and the like. In keeping on the business theme and in the interest of time, I want to open it up for some questions, but uh, two things I want you to hit on. Um, after serving two terms as a successful mayor of Detroit, um, you, you did not run for a third term, but you also have a life um, as serving as a member of board of directors of public companies. Yes. And so if you could chat about that, but also the most important question I want to leave with the students, if you could offer one piece of advice for how to have a successful and uh, fulfilling legal career. Um, if you could offer some pearls of wisdom with regard to that, that would be great as well. Let me start with the latter first. You've been given an opportunity. You're paying for it, but you've been given an opportunity <laughs> to get an outstanding education. And with that education, there is so much you can do with that education. It doesn't mean, though I love practicing law, I love being in the courtroom. And having graduated from Detroit College of Law, went to law school at night, I can't tell you how enjoyable it was to try cases against people who went to Harvard and Yale and Stanford and wind up in, in any event. <laughs> I can't tell you how pleasing it is to be able to do that. And so that's one. And then there are friends who are investment bankers. They do other kinds of things. You, you can use your legal education to do whatever it is that you want to do, but you've got to, please, don't take anything for granted. 
those of you who will graduate with top grades, you will have earned it. And those with the highest grades, you will have every opportunity for success ahead of you. But I'll also tell you the same thing I've told graduating classes. You give me a student who graduates from law school, thank you, Lottie, with a two-point and pass the bar, and they're hungry, I can put them against the person who graduates at the top of the class, if they don't continue to stay aggressive about being good and great, I can take that person and cause them to make more money, be more successful, and have a complete life. It's what you decide to do with your education and how you help people and the enjoyment that you have from it. Be ethical. Always be ethical. Return your telephone calls from clients when they call you. The same day. Never get so busy, so Im miss important or Mr. Important that you don't take time to be with your family and to enjoy your children if you get married. Whatever it is, take time to do that. There's nothing like being a lawyer to help people. We see what goes on today. There's a lot of things going on today, but lawyers can make a difference. Lawyers can make the difference that can cause people to feel very worthwhile and comfortable. The person who I've always admired was Vernon Jordan. Vernon Jordan was very helpful to me when I was developing an ABA program that would promote lawyers of color or women lawyers to be hired by large law firms, to be hired by corporate America. He did that when he was head of the Urban League. And then when he left, he was invited to serve on 11 different corporations. He continue to open the door to have women and people of color to be in C-suite positions. He encouraged corporations to utilize the services of businesses owned by people of color and women. There is today what is called the Billion Dollar Roundtable. How many people know what the Billion Dollar Roundtable is? You surprised, Tom? Um, I, I'll get that in half a second. So what I've done serving on corporate boards is that I wanted to make equal, equal opportunity across the board for everybody. It is amazing what you can do on a corporate board. I'm a fellow of the National Association of Corporate Directors. I'm very active in John Rogers and Millie Hobson's initiative uh, with black corporate directors in their conference. The opportunity is just unlimited. And that's what I've continued to do. It's important to make that happen. The Billion Dollar Roundtable, right now I think there's 26 companies that do a billion dollars a year with women and businesses of color. Walmart, for example, Walmart does a direct spend of four billion dollars and then they have an affected spend because they ask the people whose products they sell, it's important to us to know what you do with uh, doing business with women and people of color. They have an effective spend of another 4.2 billion. DuPont, the automotive big three, now Toyota, four. 
Johnson Controls. This is where I learned most about it because that was the first, one of the first boards I went on, and they belong to the Billion Dollar Roundtable. The world that's around you right now, with the legal education that you can get, is enormous. You're in a great institution. I've been here before when um, a friend of mine used to be the dean here some time ago. This is a great school. No, Open and I, it up. No, and, I, and what I want to do is just before uh, I'm closing things up, I know many of you have to go into class. Feel free to go into class. We're going to stay around for several minutes and still answer some questions. But on behalf of the law school, I just want to really thank you for an inspiring talk. <laughs> By the way, let me thank you for being here because you had some pizza and I was starving to death. I had a slice. <laughs> and secondly, if you've got any questions, somebody's got a mic, they'll, you can ask the questions or... Yes. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I just had a... Qu if you could look at what's still left in terms of work to do in, the, in terms of diversity in the legal department for women and women of color, um, and people of color, if you still had some areas you would li um, like to see improved, what would they be? I'd like to see it all improved. Today on my way here, I read a um, email that was put out by somebody who talks about, they had a lot of different articles being written. There was an article uh, that was written today that talked about how women general counsels, women general counsels were being disrespected by their male counterparts who are lawyers representing other companies who were disrespectful towards them in having any kind of discussion. I mean, I don't know where somebody gets that kind of chutzpah where you are going to look at a general counsel and tell that general counsel in effect that you don't know what you're talking about and so on and so on and so on, or not answer any questions of the women who are in the department working with that general counsel. You wonder how could somebody be that blatant and arrogant that they would be so disrespectful Here's somebody who's graduated from law school, has earned the right to be in the C-suite, et cetera. I will tell you, if uh, you ran into the CEO of the person who used to be the CEO of DuPont, who was a woman, you'd never do that to her. She was, I mean, you've got some women who are just outstanding. And how people can be so disrespectful. So there's a lot of work to be done. And People of color still today don't get the same equal opportunity to compete. It's only when you find general counsels like Tom Sager, who, by the way, ABA did a great job of doing a lot of different kinds of things. We, that's another conversation. But there was a little hesitancy because they were running a little tight on money and they're trying to decide how to save money. Maybe we don't need to have diversity programs anymore. So the president of the ABA, who came a couple of years after me, called and said, would you chair this committee and see if you can find some answers? I said, if you let me recommend to you people that I'd like for you to have work with me. He said, fine. First person I called was Tom Sager. Why? Because I knew what he's done. I knew what he, st what he stood for and the like. I mean, I'm just delighted to be here. I mean, Tom, I want you to know if there was no transportation, I'd have walked to get here <laughs> to be able to come and, and to tell you and your school 
what you have meant to our profession for women and people of color. He and that, the, the, our group came together and DuPont underwrote a outside entity to come in and take a look at everything that the ABA was doing and they wound up confirming the legitimacy of every, there were about six programs, the legitimate, and how, how best to do it better. He walks the walk, and so there's a lot of people who do that. It makes a difference. It ain't over. It's not going to be over. And you notice I haven't talked any politics for the day, and I'm not going to do that. But there is an absolute... They're still young, so... That, <laughs> There's an absolute need to have at least discussion and dialogue. Because when you have a discussion and dialogue, you can make changes. Next question. Yes, sir. So I was just wondering, you talked a little bit about how since the bankruptcy um, and just in recent years, Detroit, there's been some more economic activity there. I was wondering if you can just kind of tell us, especially like for, for my peers, just what the uh, labor market is for young lawyers in Detroit, because I, when I talk to people around here, the school, you know, you'll hear about the DCs and New Yorks, these bigger markets that students want to go to, but I never really hear Detroit. So I was just wondering if maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that. I'll just simply say this, whether you come there as an entrepreneur or a lawyer, first of all, you come, you're going to be joined by a number of people who have heard about what's going on in Detroit. And that's the reason why I make mention of the fact that it's important to give yourself a head start. And so if you can get the best grades that you can coming out, it gives you a head start. Um, but the opportunities are there. When I, when I was chairman of Dickinson Wright, I think we had about 300 lawyers. Uh, today, we're in the 500s. At the time, we had maybe six offices. Today, we've got 26 offices all around the country. And we are in every discipline and area that you might be able to think about. We don't, and, and what I liked about our, our law firm is that Dickinson Wright, and this is for someone who'd been in a black law firm as a partner, integrated, a white law firm, plaintiff's law firm, became a name partner. I wanted to, I wanted to be on corporate boards. I couldn't get there as a plaintiff's lawyer. And the reason is very simple. Nobody's going to have a plaintiff's lawyer sit on their board. And, and, and corporations are dealing with a lot of different issues. And so what occurred was an opportunity to go on the Michigan Supreme Court, which allowed me to learn a lot more, go into high schools and go to different places and talk about the respect for the rule of law and how important lawyers are and the roles that they play. Come to Detroit. Send your, send your resume out. There's a number of large law firms in the city of Detroit and they all are diverse. Uh, several have partners, African-American woman, and for one, another one an African-American, and uh, another one had an African-American uh, gentleman. And so all I'm saying is, is that the opportunities are there, and it's uh, no smoke and mirrors. And if you are going to open up a business, the first place you want to look is to come to the city of Detroit. Well, in the um, interest of time, we're going to um, close right now, but feel free to you know, come up, ask questions. Uh, but I want to thank you all for, for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dennis. Don't forget your phone. <laughs>